For me, it's like I'm an artist. I'm just like basketball is a part of my art. It was my instrument, right? And I treated it more like art. Like I wanted to treat it more like art than, you know, kind of like what traditional basketball was from a point guard position. You know what I mean? And that as an artist was just like always, I was going to always like challenge authority. I was going to always go against the grain and try and be more of an artist than of anything. Hi, my name is Jason Raznick, the CEO of Benzinga, and welcome to the Raz Report. As always, before we kick things off, I want to quickly tell you about what Benzinga is. Before I started Benzinga in 2010, there were very few places to get real-time information on financial markets. I thought it was unfair that Wall Street had access to this information before the average Joe investor. So I created Benzinga to level the playing field for you, the retail investor. Benzinga is for the people and by the people. Now let's dive into the show. I'm excited for this edition of the Raz Report. We have none other than Baron Davis, NBA all-star, amazing guy, philanthropist, founder of Big. Um, I was just looking at his resume of all the different activities and things he puts on. I can't wait to get into this to ask why he does it. And But before we get to that, what up, Baron? Thanks for coming on. How are you, Jason? Good to see you, man. I'm on the Raz Report. Come on, I made it. <laughs> you made it. You're, you're, you're famous. Yes, you, this is it. This is the top. Um, but thank you. So you you grew up. Um, you grew up in California. Yeah, Los Angeles, California, Southern California. Yeah. How were like middle school? Were you like an out, out like an out like an all star, outstanding basketball player back then? Middle school, high school days. Uh, I would say for me, I was kind of like a late bloomer. Uh, you know, I went to, uh, I, I come from South Central Los Angeles. Uh, and then I went to a private school uh, in Santa Monica. Uh, and, you know, for a long time, I was just a good basketball player in the LA area. And, you know, I started growing. Uh, I had a growth spurt. I would say somewhere between like my sophomore and junior year. Uh, I wind up playing in a pickup game at UCLA on Magic Johnson's team. And he was like, hey, man, like, I want you to work hard because you can make it. And I want you to go to UCLA. And then from that day, it was just kind of like a clear trajectory of like. Why didn't he say Michigan State? Uh, You know, because I was up at UCLA every day as a kid. Got it, and got it, got it. I play. Uh, and they never let me play. And the one day they let me play, I played okay. And he walked up to me and he was just like, man, you could do it. And that was just the motivation that I needed, you know, like Magic Johnson right there, my idol. So that is when you kind of knew that you had potentially a career in basketball. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that was, that's, basketball was pretty much all I had, right? Uh, as a child growing up, uh, you know, just being in a gang invested, uh, drug invested environment. Um, you know, basketball was my outlet. It was my, it was my creative tool. It was like a way that I could escape, you know, use my imagination. Um, and you know, that was, that was pretty much, I had that, I had church, I had my grandparents, um, and you know, just the kids in the neighborhood and, and that, that was, that was it. You know what I mean? And when you when you come from an environment like that, I think it's important to, you know, be able to dream, right? Be able to dream, be able to dream, use your imagination and think outside of where you are and where you could be. And so I think that was what basketball gave me the opportunity to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have an amazing story. Now, I know um, you ended up playing at UCLA close to home. But there's a story about a, a Chevy, a Chevy Blazer. Why was this, what's the story or something controversial at the time? Yeah, that was uh, uh they called it Blazer Gate. <laughs> oh my! So that's what this guy put this note in. So there, you had a Chevy Blazer, and people were wondering how you got a Chevy Blazer. That's what you're. That's the story. Yeah, got it. Like uh, at Michigan, the guys back. But, and by the way, that's all legal now. Nil, baby. <laughs> Come on, man. They, you know, kids are, kids are making some good money now. I mean, they, they, 
it should have been allowed that to happen. I think there was a lot of kids who, you know, kind of uh, future were ruined, you know, based on, you know, uh, rules and petty rules and jurisdictions of the NCAA. And, and I think that when you look at it now, you see a lot more kids that are, you know, uh, you know, well-established, right. As brands and know their power and know who they are. Right. And, you know, back in the day, those kids would have got penalized and then they would have never made it right. Or never been able to play college or never make it to the pros. And, you know, them being the number one, number two players in the country, you know, that's kind of like where you look and say, I'm glad we've evolved because there are a lot of, you know, misunderstandings, you know what I mean? Misappropriations, misinvestigations. And, you know, when you think about it, you know, now it, it, it allows kids to be more independent and choose for themselves, right? And education should be something that's shared. I don't think you have to just go to Michigan State for four years, right, to get a Michigan State education. You know, if I was doing it again, I would have probably went, you know, to another school or traveled overseas, right, and played overseas, right, because I think experience is the best teacher, uh, especially yeah. when you're in college. Absolutely. And and what the rules were, you guys, they're making all this money off you guys. And for you to drive a normal car, you know, it's like if you can't afford a car and you need to get around and you're driving a clunker and then you're going to play and you're traveling pride. You know what I mean? It's it's just so antiquated. It, 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 if you think about it, I remember Robert Trailer at Michigan. He had issues and like if the rules were different, um, this NIL thing as of now is helping. I mean, I. I'm from Michigan, Blake Corm, all these different players, JJ McCarthy. I know and support the NIL here in Michigan. You guys didn't have that. And so different times, right? Yeah, totally. And uh, shout out to Ed O'Bannon, the Bruin legend, right? For, you know, being the one that, you know, created the case, right? And took it all the way, you know, to to government, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, those Bruins. And I, I always got to give credit to Ed O'Bannon because, you know, if it wasn't for Ed O'Bannon standing up, you know, to the NCAA, none of this would be possible. Which is just just crazy. All right. So um, you were drafted, I think, third overall. What was your um, what was your signing bonus then? And do you remember what your uh, first big purchase was? Uh, I believe like my signing bonus was like 300 or $400,000. My first big purchase was, I think I bought myself a car. Got it. Was it hard to have so much money at such a young age? No, not at all. Was it fun? Yeah, it was fun. I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, it was like I always, I always say, basketball. Like when you play basketball, you don't need to spend a lot of money because basketball is free, right? The gym is free. You get to go to practice. They feed you at practice. You take food home. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you don't need to be in a you know ten thousand square foot mansion, and you don't have ten thousand square foot mansion type of stuff. You know what I mean? And so for me. Charlotte was my best teacher. I lived in the townhouse. It was two bedroom. I went and got all my furniture for um, rooms to go. Uh, oh my god! Yeah, and it's my whole house. <laughs> I, I, I went. To, uh, Harris Teeter was my place of uh, shopping. Dean and Deluca was my fine dining. <laughs> and, and, and so you were so so you were saving a lot of money then. I mean, yeah, for sure, for sure. There, there was, no, there was not a lot of money to spend. You know what I mean? When you think about it, uh, you know, I remember having first business managers and them telling me that I would spend a certain amount of budget every month, and this is what I needed. And then when I did the calculations, I was like, man, I like music, I like movies, right, and I like to go to the mall. And I like to eat every now and again. That's it. 
And so where is this budget coming from? Like, no, I don't need a $15,000 a month apartment. Like this little town home for 2,500 bucks is perfect. <laughs> I didn't even, I've, I've only had a room in college. <laughs> they, they wanted you to spend your money. Like, you know, Absolutely. uh, Absolutely. I mean, but I if mean, you it, get, it creates value. It creates worth for them. It creates, um, you know, uh, a dependency on them when, you know, they are at the helm of, you know, initiating, you know, what you do with your life. Yeah, absolutely. Were there any mentors in the NBA that helped you with off the court things like how to manage money or who were your big inspirations? That sounds like Magic Johnson was an inspiration. Uh, yeah, I would say, uh, you know, a lot of people from Eldon Campbell to Jamal Mashburn, just my teammates, you know, being around my teammates. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people, uh, I have to give a shout out to Senator Marshall Roush. He was, he was my mentor. He took me under his wing and taught me a lot about, you know, saving and, you know, uh, family office, right. Uh, you know, investing, and so I learned a lot from him, but it was really just being around my teammates and hearing and watching and seeing and being around, you know, other players in the league, hearing and watching, seeing what they were doing and just trying to emulate, you know, what was good uh, in everyone. So when did you start making investments and start and think about you and thinking about your post playing career? Well, I always thought about my post playing career because, you know, I came into the league with uh, torn ACL, out of torn ACL surgery. And so for me, it was just like, man, I just wanted to make it. You know, there was a, a laundry list and a long list of players that, you know, had made it to the NBA with knee problems, but never really kind of like, became their true self because of, you know, that ACL injury. And so for me, it was really like I was surviving. Every year I was surviving, right, because sometimes you got to play hurt in that era. Uh, you know, you didn't, you know, the year I came off the bench, um, you know, I didn't want to miss a game. The year, the next year when I started, I definitely didn't want to miss a game, right, because – you know, it it was it was just a time where, you know, you play through injuries, you play through certain things. And for me, it was like I, I was coming in injured. So I was just trying to, like, get to be the best I could and show people who I was, like, very early in my career. Right. Got it, got it. Yeah. So you worked your ass off back back then? I had to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm just, you know, to do to uh, come back from a torn torn ACL back in the, those days, and then coming back and I mean, and then becoming Baron Davis like that we know this day and age. I mean, you like that's that's impressive, uh, very impressive. How where did you get that work ethic from? I think it's just a, a it's a learned thing. You know, one I love basketball, so it was like, you know. Um, Whenever I could play basketball, no matter if I was 35%, 85%, I would play basketball. So I think that's where the drive came from. You know, I wish now, I wish back then we had the technology and the information now, how to better care, how to better manage, you know, your body, right? Uh, that would have helped. Uh, but it was just, you know, just kind of like a, you know, trust the right people. Fortunately, I had, incredible people that did my surgery, incredible therapists, you know, incredible trainers. And everybody was kind of like, you know, dedicated to like solving a root. Like I was a Rubik's cube you know, for a lot of people, for a lot of therapists, trainers. And it was like, you know, I was, I was, I was what I was fine being a testing dummy because I just wanted to figure out, you know, how I can play, you know what I mean? And I think that's just like, I don't know how, I don't know how it happened, but it's just. <laughs> would you do like, would you do anything to, to be the best? Like I recently was talking to Chris Paul and he told me to watch the movie Game Changers because it made him a vegan. And by not eating meat, he now does not have to ice his knees after games. Like, do you go to the extremes like, hey, I'm going to become a vegan for this? 
Uh, I mean, I would have if I was playing. If that was, you know, if that's what my body composition was for, was to become vegan, then I, I guess that would be it. Um, oh, oh, I'm pretty vegan. Yeah. I like I'm. I'm not a vegan, but I do eat like vegan diets every now and and again. I try a little bit of everything. Got it. Got it. Your uh, your buddy wrote back. Um, he said, "Say say hello back." Always loved that guy, Buddy being your the owner of the Caval- Cavaliers, Dan Gilbert, back in the day. Real fast, yeah. right away. He said, he said, he always, he said he always loved you. you He's know? a good dude. Yeah, we've had great conversations. He's um, a good dude. Yeah, I bet. I bet. He, he's a funny guy. I could tell you some stories. Um, okay, so you're, you've are you been investing in different startups. Web3, we're going to get to your big business, but Web3, esports, and various other industries. Is there a certain area that you're most focused on these days, or I'll say, uh, yeah, NFTs I'll, you did too? I know. Yeah, we did a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, I would say I'm more bullish on like you know, kind of sports, entertainment, tech, fintech. Um, you know, I'm the definition of the word fintech in Webster's dictionary. If you if you Google the word fintech and you type in space Webster's, it'll give you the definition and a quote by me. Kind of funny, <laughs> like funny. that. Yeah, the day it happened when they added fintech to the Webster's dictionary, it was uh-huh. like I got eight hundred people reached out to me. Now it's just been there forever, and no one says anything. <laughs> we got to digitize it. <laughs> yeah, I got we got to NFT it or something because I haven't figured out I haven't figured out how to monetize that. It would be good. Our private equity partners would be happy if I could do that. Anyway, yeah, we- yeah so you're into everything, and yeah, I would say sports, media, you know, fintech. And, you know, we just really champion, you know, investing, financial literacy, um, financial education, I would say more so. Like, uh, you know, we have a company called Big Business Inside the Game. And I always say I got my MBA from the MBA. Uh, and it allowed me through, you know, the 13 years and 15 years that I was around um, to really learn what people did to work. Uh, an off-season intern, you know, the Knicks gave me an opportunity to have a job when I got hurt. Um, and so it, it gave me a real opportunity to learn the business of basketball, the business of sports, right? How a team runs, operates, who's running, owning, and operating, right? And so, you know, for me, it was start looking at that as your power source, right? Right. And start thinking about, you know, this inside, right, of the game. Like the game is the game. The business is, you know, how it operates, right? But the inside is really your DNA. So what you bring to a basketball team is the same thing that you can bring to a fintech company, right? And so it's like, don't run away from who you are. Don't hide from who you are. Be the athlete that shows up for practice. Be the athlete that works hard, right? Be the athlete that learns and knows how to deal with the media. And then you will learn what you need to learn, you know. Uh, or, or, as far or, find, as or find others to surround yourself with. Bingo, right? Because that's, you know, that's the goal is like, you know, to work. If you can work in a team, you're going to learn from your peers, Right. Yeah, because like you, you this company is big. Um, I know it has initials and stands for things. You've been doing like, you know, um, summits for years. You have WNBA at the All Star Game, and you said in 2017 to put on a summit is not easy. And so like, it's not easy. Uh, I think it's like doing a startup in itself. Did you know what you were getting into when you decided to put on your first summit? I really did not. <laughs> I had an idea, I had a vision, you know, of, you know, bringing people together at All-Star Weekend. Sorry about that. At All That's Star- all right. Throw me around, I know. Sorry about that. Raz. Uh, Raz, man. The Raz man's getting thrown around by Baron Davis. It's so no sweet. Fault, Raz. <laughs> but no, I had a vision, and the goal was, you know, I wanted to bring people together. I wanted to showcase athletes who were doing great things, athletes as investors in different areas. And I think big was 
for me to be able to build a business that kind of catered to, you know, really like thought provoking conversations, right? Gathering of people that wouldn't normally meet each other, right? And then really for the athletes, the celebrities, the musicians, the people who were considered, you know, other, you know, uh, investors or angels, like for them to have a, a, a team or, or, or an ecosystem in a community where they can find the right team. Right. And so that's kind of the, the big thought around big is like, can we create teams and communities of people that can operate, you know, through thought leadership and look at the right entrepreneurs, look at the right investors, you know, um, and champion the right C-suites and give them opportunities to use their superpower to help, you know, amplify the next generation of, you know, great, great founders. So you come up with this idea and let's do a summit, but what, then you, and you, you have a good network, I'm sure, but what do you do next? Like, do you start calling around and try to find a venue? Are you like, like, oh shit, I'm going to have to owe this kind of money. Or do you call the NBA and you're like, Hey, I want to do this summit. They're like, okay, we'll do all the work for you. Like, like, where, how do you take it from zero to one? I guess. Uh, I just, I just start doing it. <laughs> I just yeah. start doing it. I found the venue. Uh, I start calling, you know, sponsors. Start talking to different banks. Um, I called some players, some of their managers, you know, and you know, Big was kind of like the first of its kind. Right. Uh, the very first one, because there were no athlete summits. Right. There were no right. there were no, athletes weren't sitting on panels. I was going around during the NBA season. I was like, hey, where where's everybody at at these big conferences? Right. And so for me, it was like, all right, let's get a, you know, a rock star lineup of people. But let's get people who are culturally relevant and who matter to people. Right. And like people who are still, you know, working their way up and those people who need the audience and need the right investors and to meet the right people in this environment. And so we got it. We did it at the London Hotel, um, the MBPA, uh, you know, shout out to them. Uh, we had did a partnership with them. Uh, and then we just start call like I start calling and then I start organizing the panels you know, naming the panels um, and then putting together the production team. We had, you know, we hired a production team, you know, that knew how to shoot conferences. And the rest for me was pretty much like to sit and watch and be a host. And when I needed to be on stage introducing someone, but really just being a host uh, and making sure that the right people were meeting each other in the green room, having the right conversations you know what I mean? The right people were getting in, sitting to sitting next to the right people uh, on our breaks. And I was like, yo, this is what I want to do. You know, I want to be able to understand people, learn their business, you know, learn how I can be helpful and then build a community where it's more of a how we can be helpful. Right. Um, and that's the road that we're on. And, you know, that's what we're doing right now for big. And that's what I'm most excited. Got it. And so, like, do you have someone that operates it day to day for your events or is that you? Yeah, no, we have a team now. That was uh, my, first, yeah, that, <laughs> my first event was uh, 2017. And so, so, yeah, we have a team. We have a great team, small team. Um, and, you know, we, we're, we're growing the brand. Now we have a membership club. So we're doing uh, brand partnerships, brand memberships, and uh, even uh, corporate memberships and individuals. So people have the opportunity to come to our events, uh, be a part of, you know, um, our content, right? Uh, and, and also like the experiential side as far as like Super Bowl, All-Star, right? Um, being able to come to some of these athlete-driven you know, events where they're in their comfort zone or musicians where they're in their comfort zone where they want to host and just create more full on experiential. So you have a membership club. If someone's listening to this podcast, how would they find the membership club? Like, where do they go? 
Uh, it's teambig.io. Teambig.io. That's teambig.io. And the membership club gives you access to your events, etc. Yeah, it's a content. Um, it's a content. Our newsletter, uh, podcast, and then also to our events. Uh, so people can buy individual tickets. Usually our events are private um, and invite only. And so now we're just creating and extending that to a membership club because there's just really a high demand, you know, at this point for a lot of the things that we're doing um, and, you know, a lot of great allies and just a great network of people. So our goal was to create this membership club so we can do more, you know, experiential events, more smaller events as well. Got it. Do you have to be in California to be like a user of this or? No, you can be anywhere in the world. <laughs> okay, anywhere in the world. And like there's, you have, you have brand partners and um, a bunch of athletes that get involved with your, your stuff. We do. We have a ton of people that have come through. Um, we're actually in the process of finishing our app uh and our rays so that is going to basically make it more of a global opportunity for us to reach you know how much you're raising we're raising five million and why raise just to have more people involved like you you could support it yourself but just to have more people involved i think for me it was the overall strategy was you know to think about the people in the network and think about collective ownership right and Basically, it was like for me to own a platform all by myself wouldn't make any sense. Uh, and so, you know, we are we're baked around, you know, a thought collective and around collectives. And so there's co-founders, there's hosts, ambassadors. Um, and those are the people in our network that are pretty much investing to be, you know, partners uh, in this in this mission. If you could go back to the beginning uh of your career what would would you have done anything different with your money um i probably would say buy more real estate <laughs> that's funny my next question is what do you think young athletes should be investing in real estate or the stock market or or what uh, I, I just I, I like real estate you know um i like real estate you know the world is growing population is growing you know, people need homes. Real estate would have been your thing. I've been doing mobile. I've been investing as passively Ask. in mobile home parks lately. They, oh, they, yeah. yeah, they're big in the Midwest. I don't know if they're big out there, but in the Midwest, they're huge. Bro. Yeah. Um, okay. Just a few more, a few more questions. How many unread text messages do you have? Probably like a couple thousand. You do. So you're one of those, you'll see the blue dot and it doesn't bother you. Uh, a lot of times it's more group chats. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, my grandmother, don't tell people what, don't tell people everything you're doing. Interesting. And yet we're talking about your company here and go to teambig.io, you know, to do the opposite. But you got you got to tell them some oh, stuff, kinda, right? Kinda, yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of. More so like the people that try to duplicate or mimic, you know, a lot of the things that, you know, you work hard to do. So, like, be careful who you share your information to when you're building. So that would be my advice to any entrepreneur. No, makes sense. Makes sense. I, I hear you. What do you do when you feel stressed or discouraged? Or do you ever um, feel distressed? I hang out with my kids. Um, yeah. And then I make music. Or I like make music. Yeah, I'll probably make some music. Where can I can I go to like Spotify and get the Baron Davis uh there's a, Baron Davis, uh, there's a Black Santa. There's a Black Santa mixtape. Uh, on that. I made a. Uh, we made we made a holiday Christmas album. It's called the uh, Black Santa Winter Wonderland. How does it go? Can you give us a little? Can you give us a little rendition? Uh, no, you got no. It's 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 all different characters. Okay, I gotta go. Okay, it wasn't like you saying. Christmas is here. You must be 
there. I don't know. I can't do this right now. No, it, like if you re- you you'll recognize my voice in one of the songs. I'll say that. Right. I had Rick Ross perform. <laughs> I had Rick Ross perform at our cannabis event, our like um, after, and he wouldn't start unless I made a rap, and I'm like terrible, and so I started off. Do the ladies run this, and then do the fel- and then I got I got a rap. I had Rick Ross on stage, Mike Tyson, and Ric Flair, and Rick Ross made me uh, rap. It was hilarious. I'll be the DJ. I'll be the there. DJ. We'll do it next time. We rented out Live. All right, okay, a couple more. <laughs> We rented out live. It was it was crazy. Uh, yeah, Rick Ross, <laughs> Rick Flair, Mike Tyson. There was someone else there. I don't even remember. But um, what was your most difficult challenge in life? Uh, convincing people that athletes are more than athletes, like the LeBron James line. Yeah, I mean, just like we're creatives. You know, we're we're high-capacity thinkers. Yeah, so, no, and, I, yeah, I would say that has been that has been the thing, that we are much more than what you would think. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I can tell. I mean, you're, like, it, it, it's like you played basketball, but you're not a basketball player. That's what I would say, like, about you. Like, yes, you can play basketball, you can come kick my ass, but you're way more than basketball. You're a human that has aspirations for way more and you also want to give back and put the right people in the room you, it's like the room where it happens like your whole summits you didn't create that as like hey i want to go make a quick a quick buck i think the genesis of was you wanted to put the right people in the room who didn't get the opportunity to be in the room right yeah i think for me it's like i'm an artist you know what i mean and like i'm just like basketball is a part of my art you know what i mean and it and and it's it was my instrument, right? And I treat yeah. it more like art. Like I wanted to treat it more like art than, you know, kind of like what traditional basketball was from a point guard position. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that as an artist was just like always, I was going to always like challenge authority. I was going to always, you know, uh, you know, go against the grain and try and be more of an artist than of anything. And I think that's why, you know, I do acting, you know, get into acting. I got into all that stuff, you know, direct films and things like that. Cause it was like, man, let's push the limit because, you know, we're sitting here on this plane, on this bus with all these great ideas. And like, I'm not watching no, I'm not watching movies anymore that are like, groundbreaking movies that are great ideas you know what i mean it's like hey man like yeah. what about that movie that you know uh robert tractor trailer was telling me about you know what i mean it's or you know where's the george gervin documentary you know there's just a lot of a lot of that and i think as an artist it's just respecting history respecting storytelling and like you know wanting to entertain so Aaron, this guy here wants me to ask you these quick NBA questions. They're really quick. I don't, they're not my type of questions, but he just, is it cool if I ask you a few more? It's, yeah. it's all NBA. Okay. If you, um, LeBron or MJ, why? This is Aaron's questions, not mine. LeBron or MJ, why? Okay, that's Aaron's first question. Sorry, Aaron. That was the, his first and his last question. <laughs> See? There you go. That's what, that's what I thought. And, and that, that you can't. <laughs> I know. I, I agree with your answer. I agree. You, Aaron, you, know, you know, he's that's why, Aaron, that's why you're not Raz. You know what yes. I mean? Not because ask that question. But if you, if you want an answer, it's not an either or, it's both. And it's an appreciation for them as being artists, right? And so you have to appreciate their art their artistry their creativeness right and their you know accomplishments but you cannot compare it because they did not these artists did not live you know what i mean in the same space or create in the same space at the same time and yeah, so no. so then so then you'll ha- you probably will hate aaron's next question build a starting five of all time or current nba players Who's on your dream team? That was Aaron's next question. Man, that's just tough. 
I mean, I, I it, it it is a it it is a mood thing, depending what mood I'm in, or depending on you know uh, which part of my brain is triggering. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's a deep file cabinet. You know, uh, but it's you know, and it's my fa- I I just say my favorite people. All right. Like, no, and there's a there's a huge laundry list of players, but you got a uh, Kobe, Kobe for me. Uh, I would say Magic Johnson for me. Uh, Allen Iverson for me. Um, Steph. I mean, Steph is one of my favorite players for sure. Uh. Put stuff in there. Uh, I mean, Michael, Michael, Michael Jordan, LeBron. Yep. You know, they all my Larry Bird, Larry Bird, Larry Bird. Yep. I mean, there is no five. There's just like, who do you love and why do you love them? It's kind of like, you know, a lot of times how I how I answer or even ask that question because it's a hard question. Yeah, I'm a Pistons guy. Back in the day, I was I, there. Pat- Pat, Pat O'Brien was announcing. I was there back in the day. I was a ball yeah. boy. My son went viral with Steph Curry like two years ago playing rock, paper, scissors. And Steph won and like signed this poster. It was, it was hilarious. It was a rock, paper, scissors <laughs> game. It, had, like, it has like 60 million views. And we That's just ran hilarious. into Steph when he was in Detroit. Um, what's your favorite Kobe memory? Uh, my favorite Kobe memory is going to his house when he was before his rookie year. And, you know, just kind of hanging out. And I was like, yo, he, he we went in his room and he had all his film. And I was like, bro, what are you doing? He was like, man, it's all I do. I sit and watch film. I was like, you're insane, bro. We're only 18 years old. <laughs> he was just like, he had just all kind of tape. And he was just like, yo. This is what I'll be. I'm like, man, what you be doing, dog? Like, if you ever want to hang out, you know, we at UCLA. He was like, uh, just watch it tape. Did do you learn a lot from him? Well, I would say his will, his competitiveness. But when you're playing against Kobe, you got to be, you got to have this Superman approach and you got to be a high intellectual because, you know, he, he just had this competitiveness and this. And he could think at a high capacity, you know what I mean? And strategize and figure out and slow the game down. And I think for me, that's kind of like when I watched him, what I started learning, I started, once I started learning to slow down, right? And start playing at a more of a thinking capacity. Um, then it, it, my game evolved. I became more dangerous, right? And I can make more adjustments. And I think that's kind of more so what I learned from him was like, not only was he like this incredible artist, but he was like this scientist, you know what I mean? And so like, he really studied like the science of the game and, you know, his patience, his pace, all of those things were like, it was based on his art form that he wanted to create, but it was, it was kind of like embedded in science, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I feel like you have that art, artistic nature. So teambig.io, you got these summits coming up. You can join a member. You can join the, can hear podcasts, anything else that you have on the horizon that people should check out. Um, you know, anything uh, NFT, black Santa, I was going to say. So black, that's come on, man, support the movement. Uh, we created a character, black Santa to spread, you know, positivity, you know, the, uh, and positivity in our community, but positivity and celebration of others and their heritage and their communities. Uh, we launched League of Santas. So that's going to be like our Santa coalition of multicultural Santas, uh, from all walks. Of life. Um, and you know, right now we just, we're doing, you know, great work, uh, toy drives. Uh, I think we have a concert that Black Santa is going to. Uh, and, you know, just kind of building out opportunities for kids to get 
and receive things, you know what I mean? And, you know, just kind of keep pushing the brand forward. Yeah. And, you, you know, you talked about financial literacy and education. I think it's a social injustice. You go to schools, um, you know, where minorities are and there's high credit card offers and people don't teach about financial literacy. I'm in downtown Detroit and I went to three schools and they don't teach anything about financial literacy, like a savings account. Um, don't, you know, overspend what you don't make. And financial literacy should be one of the things that's taught middle school, high school, just basic stuff. And they don't teach it. And I and people get taken advantage of. And what you're doing and what others are doing, hopefully that changes because it's just like a social injustice because you live somewhere, you don't learn this, you know, and it's like, it's, yeah. I mean, not everyone's going to be Baron Davis, right? And how do you get that education to get to schools at a younger age? So we can create more Baron Davises, right? Yeah. But I mean, what if Baron Davis had financial literacy tools, you know, so when, when you get there, you know what I mean? It's your heart, your give back, the people you're investing in. It's a real, you know, there's real connective tissue, Right. Um, and that's a big thing that, you know, uh, our company you wish is doing is really thinking about building, well, building out the financial literacy application that allows kids to have real world experiences. Because if you think about education today, even, I mean, Detroit, you know, is, um, one of our examples and use cases, like how, can you get kids to go to school? You know what I mean? Government is paying so much money for kids to go to public school and kids are not even going to school, right? And one, they're not motivated, you know what I mean? And two, I think that what they're learning and how they're being taught is not a reflection of what their life experience is. And so a kid will go to school and say, well, why am I going to school when I can just do YouTube unboxings and have ads? And you know what I mean? They know way, they know way more than we do. So why can't we meet them where they are, right? And be able to reward them for the things that they are talented at, right? Because they're going to be the next drivers of innovation, you know what I mean, of our economy and where we we don't do the best jobs as adults, right? So the best thing that we can is reinforce, you know, financial literacy and financial education, you know, from our perspective down to create a holistic ecosystem. You know what I mean? Yeah. So how do you get them to get this real world experience? Uh, so it's all, it's all based on wishes. <clears throat> so kids get wishes, get wishes granted based on school attendance, based on chores, um love it and then love based it. on programs right so people like us who want to give back whether it's sports art science right yep. now kids can you know if you can't afford a, a art class or a science class you earn those wishes now you get you know the science the, you know the after school program is paid for the kids education is paid for and the kid is earning their right and their way to become the scientist is, is right? wishes is wishes part of team big uh yeah no it's uh team big has a collective it's called big dream that look over you know financial literacy got it and you know the multicultural space the family space and uh like family edutainment it's so it's so needed i i mean i like it's so needed that like the government should fund that with 20 million dollars because you're literally it's exposure i think it's unfair that because you don't know what a credit analyst is or a mortgage banker or an investment banker, then you're never exposed to it. Like I grew up in a side of town where there's a lot of doctors and lawyers. And if I grew up somewhere else, like Warren Buffett says how lucky he was that he grew up where he grew up, he could have grown up, you know, and that to me is unfair, but it's like something, how do we change that? And what you're offering with wishes in this collective hopefully makes it small dent into it. I mean, yeah, I would love for you to go into school systems, because I just think when people are given the opportunity, one of the reasons I started Benzinga, I wanted to get a job at a hedge fund. I was denied and denied, and then I created this thing, and then I only wanted to hire people that were PhDs, which were poor, hungry, and driven. I want a poor, hungry, and driven, which worked for a while, but then like I needed to hire some experience too. But that's what I want. I wanted to give people the opportunity to achieve what they, you know, 
didn't think they could achieve or what they thought they could achieve and no one gave them the chance to achieve it. That's, you know, and that sounds like what you're trying to do with wishes. And all right, I've taken enough of his time. I asked Aaron's questions. I know, Aaron, I'm sorry I didn't ask one of your questions. I know the, yeah, I know the, your favorite NBA moment. Yeah, it doesn't need, anyway, taking enough time. He has his kids, Baron Davis, entrepreneur, philanthropist, <laughs> NBA star. All right, guys, we had Baron Davis on. That was the Raz Report for the week. If you want guests to come on, feel free to email us at razreport at benzinga.com. And we'll look forward to hearing from you. I think it's razreport at benzinga.com. I don't know. <laughs>